Acts chapter 15. Um, we are somewhere in the midst of an Acts study. And, um, and we're going to look at a couple of things here tonight that I... I they are kind of controversial, but I, I don't intend them to be controversial the way I do it. I mean, the way I believe it is the way I believe it. But nevertheless, uh, I think the way you believe it should be the way you see it in Scripture. Not the way, not agreeing with me and not contrary to me, but just the way the Scripture says it. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about... The, I have to say, the scripture is not perfectly clear on. In other words, it isn't that I, I believe that I, I don't believe I'm speculating about a certain thing. But if you said, "Well, I believe it's another way," it's not the kind of thing that I'd argue about. I might say, "How'd you get that?" And if I disagree with how you got it, I might argue with you, but not because I believe one thing and you another. And this has to do with. what has come to be a problem with what people think happened to the 12 apostles. You see, when Paul started his ministry, the 12 were still preaching their ministry to whatever extent the Lord was leading them. One of the strangest of doctrines to come down the pike in the last several years, and it started many years ago, 30, 35 years ago, maybe 40, was that somehow or another dispensationalists should believe that Cornelius is in the body of Christ. Cornelius was saved in Acts chapter 10 by a certain method that we, you know, when, when we assume that the people, we do this all the time, when we, we, we preachers, when we assume that the people who are listening to us are going to believe us, we leave off details. Do it all the time. And that's a grave error. We ought not to do that. And yet, we don't want... To, see, we do that because we're afraid we're going to be too so repetitious that people won't enjoy listening to us. Nevertheless, there's a thing about whether or not the twelve continued their ministry after Paul got saved. Listen, I don't know how to make this any clearer. The apostle Paul wasn't connected to the twelve. Him having a ministry has absolutely nothing to do with the twelve apostles and their ministry. Ever. You see, when we consider what Christ said about blasphemy, and we consider what Paul as Saul, the Pharisee, did in Acts 7, 8, and 9, when we consider the things that he did, you can't possibly put them together. You can't say the people Jesus was talking to and the people that Paul was talking to became one. That isn't going to work. You know why? It's contrary to sound doctrine. And Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, if there be anything contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was, given, was put in my trust. You see, what Paul had could not be what the twelve had. Therefore, what the twelve had could not be what Paul had. And people willingly mix those things together as though God were not taking any notice. Now, let me get that back off of here. To go on to say, there was a certain thing that happened that caused another certain thing. And then that, those two certain things caused something else. And the Apostle Paul answers them. Not in the book of Acts, but the event was in the book of Acts. Notice, if you will, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now think about them. These certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren. Well, where did they come down to? Well, the last place Paul was at in chapter 14 is verse 26. And thence they sailed to Antioch, from whence 
They had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They is Paul, Barnabas, and when they left there the first time, they had Mark with them. He didn't stay with them, but he was with them. So here's Paul and Barnabas. They go out, and they go to perform a ministry. It takes them about 11 years, something like that. And here in Acts 11, this is Acts 13, verse 3. Holy Ghost sent them out. This is uh, chapter uh, 11 years. At the end of chapter 14, verse 26, that ministry which they performed was fulfilled. And when they fulfilled it, they wound up back in the place they started at, which was Antioch. They went out from Antioch, spent 11 years, come back to Antioch. Now, chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea, obviously to Antioch, taught the brethren. Now, the big question is, why would those who come down from Judea teach these people in Antioch? Well, I know why. Because Satan loves chaos. Those in Judea who came, here's Judea over here. Judea is the land in which sat Jerusalem. But these men from Judea were not necessarily from Jerusalem. You can't prove they were from Jerusalem when you read the word Judea. You can't. So nevertheless, they go to Antioch. They had no business going to Antioch. Alright. Now, Notice, if you will, in verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. Don't you know? This had been Paul and Barnabas' ministry. They started here. They go back there. And they're, they have a fulfilled ministry. And here comes along some interlopers who are going to get in the way of that fulfilled ministry and foul it up. Notice. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other with them, we'll see who that is in a moment, should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Strong implication that those certain men who taught the brethren in Antioch did not include elders and apostles. Now, I want you to go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. Keep all of that in mind, and then we're going to see here in Galatians, the book of Galatians, how Paul handled this. You know, the Bible teaches us through the Apostle Paul that we should be jealous with a godly jealousy over our ministry, whatever that is. Well, you're fixing to see that in action right here. The Apostle Paul with Barnabas are very jealous of their ministry with godly jealousy. Notice, if you will, in in Galatians chapter 1, verse um, 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the, G the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem, which to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And that, that of course, happens back in Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, and other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, uh, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and that is this 11 years. Uh, starting in Syria, then Cilicia, and then round about. And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, where these guys come from. Unknown by face. Um, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Now, so these men who had heard that he, he who once persecuted the faith, which he once persecuted, he now preached. Now I'm not trying to tell you that these men of Judea came down to Antioch thinking Paul had preached the same thing that the twelve did.
they would have known he couldn't. He had persecuted us in times past, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Think about it. If Paul was persecuting the faith of the people of Judea, were the people of Judea who were in that faith filled with the Holy Ghost, you have zero reason to say they weren't. So it looks as if they were, since there's no reason to suspect that they were not. Since in uh, Acts chapter 4, all those who had believed Peter's gospel, uh, the twelve's gospel, were filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and spoke in tongues, etc., etc., in Acts chapter 4, when they sold out and had all things common. Now, these people come down from Judea. Are they really thinking that Paul is preaching the same gospel? The same thing? The same doctrine? How could they think like that? So, well, they didn't know any different. Well, that's true. They would not have known any different. Really, it is. It's true they would not have known any different. But, they also would have had no reason to believe that he could preach the same gospel. Why? Because he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Well, what were they thinking that he preached? I haven't the foggiest idea. You know why? Because what I just read about that is all the Bible says about it. So let's not speculate on what those people thought. But we did find out in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, that they put works into salvation. Why would they do that? Because works was preached in salvation back here. And by the way, don't let somebody who thinks that salvation has always been by grace through faith, erroneously, don't let them change your mind about that. Go back there and see the works of righteousness which they did. And by the way, that will give you a great big clue about Cornelius. He did works of righteousness and we'll come back to him in a little bit. But the point is, he did works. He was right with God because he did works of righteousness. So were these. How do you know that? Because they came down there and preached it. That's not difficult. That's what they were doing. Now notice chapter 2, Galatians 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So now you got this this fulfilled ministry right here, Acts chapter 14, 26, by these two guys right here, Paul and Barnabas, and together with Titus. We'll just put a plus Titus right there. They go to Jerusalem. And when they go to Jerusalem, they go because somebody has come down from Judea and taught the brethren that they must keep the law of Moses. That's why they go. Now notice Galatians 2, verse 2. And I went up by revelation. I think it's important that he doesn't say we. I'll tell you why. At the end of the book, I'm sorry, at the end of Acts chapter 15, Barnabas is going to leave Paul's ministry. Why? Because it was fulfilled. So well, why did Barnabas go with him to Jerusalem? Barnabas was with him in the beginning at Jerusalem. Barnabas was with him for the ensuing 14 years, if you will, except for the three years that he went to Arabia. And now here's Barnabas taking a stand with him by going to Jerusalem. And he took Titus with him also. So Barnabas is going to Jerusalem for a reason. Notice verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. If, if we switch back real quickly and look at Acts chapter 15, don't do that right now. But if you look back there, you'll find out that they went in unto the brethren, and then the, and it, the, count, the, the, the people that were sitting there to discuss this whole thing with Paul and Barnabas and Titus and the brethren were the 12 apostles or the 11 apostles. Notice now, uh, verse chapter three, verse um, uh, chapter two, verse three. 
But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. These people wanted something from Paul and Barnabas, and they wanted the proof of it in Titus. The compelling of him to be circumcised ain't going to cut it. Now hold on to Galatians 2 and go back to Acts 15. And notice in Acts chapter 15. Verse 5. They're they're sitting or standing in front of the apostles and elders. And they're declaring the things that God had done with them. Now verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, go hold on there and go back to Galatians chapter 2. Of those people, the false brethren unawares brought in, came in privately to spy out our liberty of verse 4. Now verse 5. He says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. We did not put ourselves in subjection to them. They had no reason to think they had any power over us. It was known quickly when you say, no, not for an hour. Notice why. Verse 5, last half of the verse, that the truth of the gospel might continue with the Galatians. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you, he said. What is the truth of the gospel? The truth of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification, and that anything added to that changed it from the gospel. The truth of the gospel is through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So out the window goes Paul and Barnabas and Titus allowing anything about the law to be involved not going to be involved. So people say, well, boy, that'll settle it. That's the end of the law. That's the end of kowtowing to the Jews. No, hang in there. It ain't over yet. Look back in Acts chapter uh, 15 again now for just a moment. Uh, You might as well hang them both there. Pick them up by the pages. Peter has something to say. Verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. All of a sudden, because it says the word of the gospel, somebody is going to want it to be Paul's gospel. Well, pray tell, how would Peter have gotten Paul's gospel to preach it to this Gentile? His name was Cornelius. How could that have occurred? Well, biblically speaking, it cannot occur. And I suggest we don't go anywhere else to try to find it. I'm not interested in Dr. Snodgrass's opinion on the whole thing or Dr. McGillicuddy's opinion on the whole thing or the other several doctors, whether they be big or whether they be small, whether they be loud or whether they be soft. I'm not interested in what they believe took place that would cause Peter to preach Paul's gospel to Cornelius. You know why? Because I've got the scripture on it. I know what Peter preached to Cornelius. I can find it in Acts chapter 10. I will in a moment. Once again, my point is, are we listening to the details of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts? We got him Starting that ministry in chapter 13, verse 3, finishing it in chapter 14, verse 26, and defending it in chapter 15. And Barnabas is right there with him, along with Titus. All right? Now, what Peter says next in verse 8, he says, And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. If Cornelius got the Holy Ghost the way the Lord did it unto the twelve apostles. That's what Peter said, wasn't it? God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. 
Well, then Cornelius got the Holy Ghost the same way. The same way Peter did. Go back to Acts chapter 2. See how hard it is to get through any portion of the book of Acts in a fast and an expedient time. Notice in chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, first of all, Jesus says to them in verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So they're going to have the Holy Ghost come upon them. Now look in chapter 2. Verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice it says, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right, go to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Peter begins to speak to Cornelius in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation... He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now why would Peter say concerning Cornelius that he feared God and worked righteousness? Well, he knew him. Say, so, well, how did he know him? He knew him by the power that rested in him, which is the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen? Look back in chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now watch verse 2. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Chapter 10, verse 35. Peter says, In every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. Let me ask you something. Was Cornelius worthy of that position, of that categorization? Yes, he was. How do I know? I got verse 2. That isn't all. Peter did not talk Cornelius into believing in Jesus. Chapter 10, verse 36. Peter still speaking. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ... He is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know. So, well, how did Peter know that he knew? He had the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? He had, Peter had the Holy Spirit. How did he know Cornelius knew the Lord Jesus? Knew the word which Jesus preached? He had the Holy Spirit. That word I say, ye know. Which was published throughout all Judea. And I wasn't talking about some newspaper and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we. He pulls it away from what Cornelius knew and now speaks of what he and the rest of the apostles knew. Verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, including Cornelius, not to Cornelius, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, the twelve apostles, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Now here's the thing. The verses thus far do not say anything at all about Cornelius being included. It doesn't say Cornelius was included. Keep reading. Verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now watch. 
While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Go back to chapter 15. Peter says, middle of verse 7, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Then I know that from verse 35 on, 34 on, down through 43, Peter preached the gospel that the Lord had given him to preach even unto a Gentile, and the Gentile was baptized with the Holy Ghost just like Paul, uh, Peter was. How do I know that? Because that's what Peter said. Giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. Look in chapter 11. When, uh, I'm sorry, chapter, I'm going the wrong way. When Peter goes back to Jerusalem, he has to defend what he has done in the house of Cornelius, and look what he says to them. Verse 15, chapter 11, verse 15, as I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning, as in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, 3, 4, 5. Baptism with the Holy Ghost. Cornelius was not in the body of Christ. He wasn't baptized by the Holy Ghost. He was baptized with the Holy Ghost the same way Peter was. People say, well, I just don't think there'd be a Gentile in that group. Well, then take it up with the Lord. He's the one who had all this stuff written down. Seem reasonable? Look back in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 45. The Holy Ghost has fallen now in verse 44. Now verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? They're going to bat Peter's going to baptize him. Does so in his whole household, it looks like. Now notice. Um, um, notice in um, let's see. Read verse forty three with me again. To him, Jesus Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Wow. Go back to Acts chapter 3. To believe in him is to receive the remission of sins. Now notice, if you will, back here in Acts chapter 3, Peter is in the temple. Preaching. And he talks about receiving the atonement, blotting out Well, how could they get the blotting out? Notice in Acts chapter three, verse nineteen. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. There's the mouth of holy, all the holy prophets speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ which Peter has just said he's going to return and when he returns they're going to get their sins blotted out. Well, what's this thing about remission? Back in chapter 2. Back in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. When the, the men want to know, what do we do? Peter answers them, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What happened to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 43? He was promised the remission of sins. What was he, what was he like them about in the sense of these sins, they were remitted. His sins were remitted. What's that mean? He's going to have to wait until there's a day coming when his sins are blotted out. And that's when Jesus Christ returns. That's what Peter preached. He 
Acts chapter 15, he's preaching exactly the same thing he preached in Acts chapter 2. He preached it in Acts chapter 3. He preached it in Acts chapter 4 and 5. He preached it in Acts chapter 10 to Cornelius. And he's still here saying exactly the same thing in Acts chapter 15. Was he preaching Paul's gospel? Nope. How come? Wasn't his to preach. How come he didn't change? The Lord didn't tell him to. Find me any scripture anywhere where the Lord told him. Peter's the man who held the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand the keys of the kingdom of heaven? He said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Fairly strong fellow right there, wouldn't you say? I'd say. And in Acts chapter 15... Peter was just as strong as he was in Acts chapter 2. Peter just stood and said the words that came out of his mouth by the Holy Ghost. And he never once said, Boy, we're all so happy to be over here with Paul in the body of Christ. Never once said that. He never once said that Cornelius' sins were blotted out. So Cornelius isn't in the body of Christ and Peter isn't in the body of Christ and the twelve apostles are not in the body of Christ and certain which came down from Judea are not in the body of Christ. Bless your soul, they're not in the body of Christ. That's easy. That's not difficult. So what church were they in? They were in the church they were already in. So what church was it? It's the one Jesus mentioned in Matthew 16 when he told Peter he had the keys to it called the kingdom of heaven. You know, the greatest problem in settling the issues about rightly dividing the word of truth is to fail to understand that there are three inheritances and there are three churches and there are three gospels that are preached. All right. I'm in Acts 15. I don't know where I left y'all, but I'm in Acts 15. So go to Acts 15. In Acts chapter 15, that's all right, Dennis, I promise you haven't missed a thing. In Acts chapter 15, notice if you will, when Peter speaks, they all quiet down. Notice he says, go on with what Peter preached, lest there will be some say I didn't read it. Verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That would be Cornelius and the Gentiles in his household, along with Peter and those who came with him, the certain which came with him that were astounded at the whole thing. Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now notice. Now therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, meaning Paul and Barnabas and Titus, which neither, we, uh, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And yes, he is talking about um, the um, transposition, if you will, um, of the law under Moses and the law along in the um, kingdom of heaven. Now, if you want to understand that real carefully, you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 real carefully concerning the things about the law that are in there. To give you an idea, the law said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, If you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Is that a change in the law? You better believe it is. Is it stricter? Yes, it is. What was not the same after Christ's resurrection? After, actually, after Christ's crucifixion. What was not the same? What was not the same was there is no reason to go to a man-made temple to find a place of solace and... Um, for and uh, uh, a remission of sins. They went there under the law of Moses. Many of them went daily 
They went into the temple at the hour of prayer. They went in there whenever they went to Jerusalem. They went in there. They went in there three times in the year. There were certain things that they did. They brought sacrifice unto this and sacrifice unto that. As long, when they were in the land, there was a lot of all of that going on. When they were in Judea, all really was going on was the feast days. But after Christ's crucifixion, the veil was rent in two. There was nothing behind there. And as a subsequence to that, they never ever had to do the daily sacrifices ever again. There is no record of anyone doing it after the veil was rent in two. Not even the religionists. They didn't do it either. You can never find a place in the, in the New Testament, in, the, in Matthew through Revelation, you can't find a place where they did a daily sacrifice on the basis of the Old Testament law. They didn't, however, throw everything out. They did certain things which were accorded to the law, though not like offering up strange sacrifice, as in the case of turtle doves or uh, pigeons or whatever it was they might have sacrificed, nor did they bring a, a lamb. After. There was no keeping of the... Um, uh, by people of God, there was no keeping of the uh, ordinance of the Passover. Christ is the Passover. And on and on and on. They didn't do that anymore. Why? Because there wasn't any need. The temple was not made by hands. Read Hebrews chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and that'll clear that up for you. But don't try to attach it to the church, the body of Christ, the way Paul uh, attached Christ as our Passover in 1 Corinthians 5 and, and some other things that he did in the book of 1 Corinthians, which we'll get to also, by the way, uh, when we get to the Corinthian church. But don't put it on Paul's group. We've already seen the separation of Peter and Paul's group. There's no reason to do that. Now, in Acts chapter 15, then, what Peter says next is, verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they... And so once again, the people who want Peter to be in the body of Christ for some strange reason, they jump on that and say, see there, they're all going to get saved the same. Well, yes, they are. It's called the blood of Jesus Christ. The difference is when did they get it? When Paul wrote, when Paul spoke in Acts chapter 13, through this man is preached unto you, not the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Peter never said that ever. Peter, on the other hand, taught people that they were going to have grace applied to them when Christ comes back, and that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 13. In fact, if you want to find a fascinating study, 1 Peter chapter 1, read the odd number verses, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. Those are amazing. It tells you about their doctrine. Certainly is not Paul's doctrine ever. Doesn't match Paul anywhere. Only matches what Peter and the twelve apostles were doing and it matches them as long as you can see them in the Bible. You never see anything where they changed. Not ever. Now, Acts chapter 15, he says, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. He's talking about Paul and Barnabas having grace. He's not talking about him and Cornelius having grace the way Paul and Barnabas had it right now. But it was what was coming to them. We believe that we shall be saved even as they. Now that settles the issue here. It settles the issue in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. That doesn't mean the issue is settled, by the way. This may seem like it, but it doesn't. Now notice, verse 12, Acts 15, 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. After they had held their peace, James answered. Now this James is probably the half-brother of Jesus. It appears that he is. And there are certain of people who are among us today who don't need to be called out or named about this, but they want to say, and it's all right with me if they say this, I don't agree with it, but that it's all right with me if they say it, they want to say that James was an interloper and that he was not uh, an apostle, he's not a true apostle, and that he was not, uh, uh, that he usurped Peter's authority here, and on and on and on. 
Well, the really interesting thing to me is that Paul knew all about Peter's authority. And Peter knew all about his authority. And he's sitting there. Now, how is it that James could usurp Peter's authority with Peter sitting there? I don't believe he did. Although it is him that comes up with this statement, notice in verse, um, this, this is fascinating. I've got to read this whole thing. This, this really, you know why this fascinates me? Because this fulfills so much scripture that most people today don't really understand what it fulfills that, and it answers a lot of questions about Gentiles like Cornelius. Notice, Simon, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, look at uh, James's reply. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Verse 14. Simeon, that's Simon Peter. Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a name for his people. And to this agree the words of the prophets. The prophets are going to agree that what Simon Peter did with Cornelius in his household is all right. Yes, they are. James seems to know that. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. The key words are the first two of verse 16. After this. He said that the prophets agreed with what Simon Peter did with Cornelius. Verse 14, Simon Peter's declaration of what he went and done, did. Verse 15, to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, after this I will return. Then I've got a thing over here. i got this time thing. Over here, when they do, I just erased it there, but when they do get their sins blotted out, guess what else they get? There's a day over here when Jesus Christ returns and their sins are blotted out. Sins gone, I'm going to say. Then Christ is going to sit upon the throne over all the earth. In other words, he's going to rule over all the earth according to Zechariah. The last chapter of Zechariah, twice, it tells first that the Lord's going to fight their battle and then he's going to rule over all the earth. Now notice, he says, to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, after this I will return, verse 16, and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. Well, bless your soul, right over here in that great big old triangle piece of land is David's temple going to be rebuilt over there. When? The thousand year reign of Christ, which is what James is referring to in the passage. Now notice about how Gentiles fit in. I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. Verse 17. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Well, I want you to think about this as a project. You don't need to think about this tonight because you may want to go to bed sometime tonight. I want you to think about this. I want you to go to Isaiah... People are always trying to say that the gospel of Christ is in Isaiah 53. Okay, take Isaiah 53 and see that the gospel is there and it's the gospel that Peter preached, whether it be to the people in Pentecost or whether it be to Cornelius in Acts 10. Isaiah 53 is that gospel and Cornelius is a type of Gentiles and what he's doing is coming to their light that says if you can't see that that says Israel's light now there's Isaiah 53 you look at 56 60 61 63 and 66 and see how the Gentiles do that and tell me that sounds like the church, the body of Christ. Come on, folks. Don't mix up things that are different. Things that are different are never alike. It's a rule. You can count on it. Things that are different are not alike. If that's oversimplistic, let it be. 
Get it straight in your head. If you mix up things that are different, God Almighty is going to keep you from rightly dividing the word of truth. As a matter of fact, He'll send a blindness upon you and it'll be like the blindness that He set upon Israel. The good news is you're in the grace dispensation you can change your mind. But if you think Peter and the twelve lost their ministry, you're not reading the book of Acts. If you think that the twelve uh, the, that the Gentiles are in the same church as the twelve apostles and that, that all that church is the same one that Israel's in, then you haven't read the book of Acts. Don't do that to it. You know, when I started this, if you'll recall, last week out on the board I had the Acts 9 time frame, and then I had Acts 11, and then I had Acts 13, and then I had Acts 15, and I told you that Acts 15 was not a ministry. It, that it was not a ministry of Paul's. It didn't qualify as a ministry that the Apostle Paul performed. Two, three reasons why I believe that's true, and this is just me now. You don't have to, you don't have to follow this if you don't want to. You don't have to believe this. In Acts chapter 15, Paul is compelled to go argue with the people in Jerusalem. He went up by revelation, Galatians chapter 2 said, and that's what he did. Went up by revelation, told them the gospel that he was preaching. So then, if he went, if they, did, they didn't know it, if he went up and told it to them, communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, Galatians 2 said. Well, then they didn't know it. So he didn't go up there and drag them over into the body of Christ. Peter and James just denied that in Acts chapter 15. So Paul didn't have a ministry there. Later on, I believe it's later on, Acts chapter 18, I believe, is when the Lord told him, get quickly out of Jerusalem, they won't receive your testimony of me, and on and on. So he didn't have a ministry there in Jerusalem. In fact, he never did. The point, though, that I may, except to deliver, by the way, the gift, that he, that would be ministering. He, he took the gifts up there on two different occasions. But what I'm saying to you is that right here in the Acts chapter 15, there isn't a ministry being performed. The ministry that is being performed, if you will, is Peter and James. If it's the Lord's brother, so be it. Peter and James are performing a ministry unto Israel who is... who. The Israel which is listening to them, they are performing a ministry in taking the taking the responsibility off of them to take anything to the Gentiles. Seeing that Paul and Barnabas and Titus have a ministry in that direction. So Simeon and James, now notice if you will, verse 22 after James suggests that they write a letter to them, verse 22, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and they wrote, wrote letters by them after this manner, and you've got the letter there, and it says that when, when they dismissed, verse 30 says, when they dismissed, they came to Antioch, uh, and it's Paul and Barnabas, look at verse uh, 27, when, they're writing the, 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 when they are writing the letter, they say, we have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the, the same things by mouth. Then Judas named Barsabas and Silas didn't write the letters. So if I go back to verse 23 and I see that the word they wrote letters, I have to go back up past Paul and Barnabas and Judas and Silas and see that it was the apostles and elders that wrote the letter. Well, if it was the apostles and elders that wrote the letter, then the apostles and elders agree with the separation of the two ministries. Peter never preached the gospel of Christ. Paul never preached the gospel of the kingdom. Let me say that again. Peter and the twelve apostles and James the Lord's brother did not preach the gospel of Christ. Neither did Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Titus. They didn't preach the gospel of the kingdom. After Acts 15, go back to Galatians chapter 2 now.
Galatians 2. We stopped at the start of verse 5. He says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, that would be, let's see, the Pharisees that believed, uh, James, oh yes, and Peter. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. In other words, they couldn't tell Paul anything that he didn't already know. But notice, but contrarywise, when they saw, so they learned something. They learned something. From when Barnabas and Paul talked to them there, they learned something. Notice verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. i got to get rid of this right here. I know that breaks your heart. See me wipe all that stuff off, right? I apologize for all the scratching around I do on the board. Sometimes it seems silly to me, but it helps me remember what I said, if nothing else. Now, it said there was a gospel of... Two things. Gospel of the uncircumcision. Was it only to uncircumcised people? No. But it was a gospel that did not include for any way, in any way, shape, or form uh, or include a reason for circumcision. It was the gospel of, in association with, no circumcision. Uncircumcision. Then he said that there was a gospel of circumcision. Say, so, well, did they have to be circumcised? I don't know. The gospel was in association with those who were of the circumcision. Were they the same gospel? No. Notice verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they under the circumcision. Well, now we've got no mixing up of the doctrine of the two gospels anywhere. There isn't any anywhere. It's not mixed up anywhere. So there was a gospel of the uncircumcision that Paul had. There was a gospel of the circumcision that Peter had. The Lord Jesus Christ is Lord of both men. The Lord Jesus Christ knows that there's no mix-up. The Lord Jesus Christ knows these men. And He knows they're going to do that. They're going to carry that forth. He already said about Peter that with the people and the and the uh, uh, twelve uh, the twelve apostles in general, but Peter as their leader, none of them was lost. John chapter seventeen, none of them was lost. He knows Paul is going to carry it forth because he has watched him already, and he already knows what he's going to do. And no matter how long it takes Paul to get all of it done. He's going to complete it. The Lord knows that. So the Lord doesn't mix up the Gospels. He separates the men. Notice verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. And bless your soul, they did it. How do I know they did it? Because the Bible said that's what they were called unto and it never tells you they didn't do it. So, well, that don't make any sense. It makes better sense than to think they went out there and quit. 
We're talking about God's word here. Be any problems with God's word? No. Well, then did Peter have the gospel of the circumcision? Yep. Did he do it? Yep. How do you know? Because God sent him to do it, and you have no record of him stopping. When he wrote 2 Peter, he was fixing to die, and he knew it. I suspect that that was written about the time frame of Acts 28. You know why? Because there's no record of Peter ever going anywhere except Jerusalem. Not after Acts 15. He doesn't go anywhere except Jerusalem. He's there in Acts chapter 21. He's not sitting over in the corner trying to decide whether or not he should follow Paul. That's not what he's doing. (laughs) He's performing the ministry the Lord gave him. How do you know that? Not only did the Lord know he was going to do it and said that he would do it until the day that he died, the Lord told him he was going to get old. At the end of the book of John, that's what the Lord told him. Well, if he's going to get old, he's going to continue on his ministry all the days of his life. How do you know that? Because he never told us otherwise. Tells you about David dying, Solomon dying. Tells you about how wicked Solomon got and how righteous David got in their old age. Tells you about many Old Testament saints and how that worked out. How they died. He told Peter he was going to live a long life. And that when he was old, there would be some that would carry him around and he wouldn't have anything to say about it. Well, should we believe Peter just gave up and quit after Acts 15? Why would he? We have no sense of how to understand who might believe Peter's gospel. And we have no reason to call him a quitter. He was a man of God who held the keys of the kingdom of heaven. No matter what else you might believe, you see in Scripture, don't change what his ministry is you got no right to do that. Take the scripture as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it, folks, and do not mix it up. Keep separate what the Lord separated. 